If I could have your attention, I'd like to call the May 8th work session of the Forsyth County Board of Education to order. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone that's here. And if we could all rise, uh, Nancy Roach is going to lead us in the pledge and invocation. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this beautiful day and for your many blessings. We ask that you would guide and direct our meetings so that it is full of wisdom, productivity, and respect for one another. Be with us in our deliberations and help us to be wise in the decisions we make for the good of all those who have placed their trust and confidence in our leadership. Give us the insight to lead with integrity so our decisions may reflect what is right and good. We pray that you will guide our thoughts when we are searching through the options and help us to be patient as the process is unfolding. Help us to make decisions that are good for all and guard us from blind self-interest. Thank you for your support and guidance. We pray that for all who are serving in the military and please comfort and bless all those who, are, who may be suffering today. In respect to all faiths and religions, amen. Please salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have before us an agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Second. A uh, motion by Ann and a second by Kristen. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. And next, uh, first on the agenda, we have presentation and discussion items. Will the Inspire presentations, Joey? We have um, two Inspire presentations this afternoon. Uh, one from Mr. James Parrish, who is the assistant principal at South Forsyth High School, and Carl Mercer, who is with us here at the central office. Um, Mr. Parrish's project this year, he focused on the TEKS process, so he'll be telling you all about that. And of course, Carl focusing on um, math and a lot of things with that. So I'm going to let them go ahead and come forward. We're going to ask Mr. Parrish if he would to come forward first and present his Inspire project. Good afternoon, my name is Jim Parrish. I'm assistant principal at South Forsyth High School. Uh, and my INSPIRE project I decided to do this year was on the TEKS process. Uh, TEKS is Teacher Keys Evaluation System, which will be, has been mandated by the state legislature to be our evaluation system for next year, 2014-2015 school year. And it's a pretty massive process. Um, I wanted to kind of, knowing that we were going to have this year to kind of acquaint our teachers with that I kind of wanted to I thought it would go well with this program to kind of formulate the a pilot program to prepare us for the next for our, for our, uh, for next year for the evaluation system and this is kind of wordy as to what why I chose to do this um, a little history about TEKS TEKS was originally initiated through the race to the top uh, grant and many uh, systems in Georgia chose to take part in that um, as they did that, they looked to other states as what the teachers with the evaluation systems in other states were. So they began to uh, kind of conceptually build this TEKS process. Uh, last year, the House Bill 244 initiated this to be mandated as our evaluation system in the state of Georgia and all counties were to comply by 2014, 2015. Um, so that's kind of the uh, kind of the kind of how it came about. Um, what we decided to do at South Forsyth was we came up with, our administrators came up with kind of a timeline, and this is the timeline to, a, to kind of acquaint our teachers uh, with, a TEAK, uh, with the kind of the TEEK system. Um, it's a much scaled down version of what TEEKS actually is, uh, and this is kind of what we did uh, during pre-planning, and I'm going to show you the slides. We kind of initiated kind of an introduction as to, what's TEAK, as to what TEEKS was. Uh, and was going to be. Some of our teachers who were new, who were coming into the school, had already were already uh, acquainted with it, so they were kind of a resource that we used. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through the process as we, as uh, kind of as what, what we went through this year. And that was spring. Um, when we talked to the teachers, these were the three points that we kind of uh, emphasized: increased achievement for our students, identify areas of strengths and growth for teachers and individualized professional growth based on specific results of our needs. 
So that was, as we were talking to the teachers, that's what we emphasized. This is what TEKS is. Uh, this is kind of a flow chart. TEKS, um, like I said, is a pretty massive uh, program. Uh, there's a TAPS portion, which is evaluations, which is done largely by the administration. There's also surveys that are in incorporated in, in TEKS, as well as uh, there's a student growth uh, percentile SGP, and also SLOW, which is a uh, which is something that are developed by the um, by the district. And again, you have these are the three basic elements that make up TEKS. Um, there are five domains and ten standards in the TEKS process. Um, each one of our teachers, and I'll go through this, kind of got one of these as we spoke to our teachers, and this is a lot of information crammed on two pieces of paper, so this is a little overwhelming. The process itself is a little overwhelming, so as we talked to them, we tried to break it up in pieces as we did talk to them. Uh, we decided to focus on four standards at South Forsyth, and these four, uh, are, these four standards were standards that we were identified in our GAPS uh, visit as areas that we needed to improve on. So instead of taking all 10 of the standards, we scaled it down to four, uh, and we articulated these at the beginning of the year. These were, this is what we're going to be looking at as we come into your classrooms. Uh, we made that very clear to the teachers and to, to, the, uh, to our uh, department chairs as well. Um, I know you're familiar with some of this information because Paige Arnett's already kind of spoken to this. We're a little bit a different situation because we are a high school. Um, I think uh, I counted it up today. We have, as of right now, we have 163 full-time staff. We have 100, um, so at each one of those will have to be evaluated through this process, uh, either TEKS or LEAKS, which is a leader evaluation system. And uh, next year, we'll have probably about 183 teachers certified personnel that will have to be evaluated through this process. So we are a little bit different. Uh, as we spoke to our teachers, we broke that up into PAC. Uh, we had conversations with our PACs. Uh, I had social studies, uh, I had social studies, ESOL, and fine arts. So we were able to break those groups together down and kind of this is where we talked about what we were looking for. We gave them these. Um, we talked about why TEKS, what it is, domains and standards, and the, ske the schedule for the, and the, eva for the evaluation. Um, we had our teachers, um, I'm going through this fairly quickly because there's a lot of information. We had our teachers log in. They have to do a self-evaluation. That's part of the process in the beginning of the year. So they tell us what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, one of the things that I found as I was doing this was this is an extremely difficult to sit down in a classroom and you, this is actually the evaluation form for each teacher for each evaluation. Uh, so I kind of, with the help of some of the people at the state and some of our administrators, we shrunk this down to one page and we were able to actually, this was a much more functional document for me and this is actually from a teacher that, um, that was evaluated and you can see the areas. Um, I did do one maybe, or I did a couple of extra areas just because they touched on that, as the teacher touched on that. And you can kind of see how it's divided and how uh, the language that's used. Um, I also went through and made a notebook of all the teachers that I, that, I, that I taught, I mean, I'm sorry, that I evaluated. And this is kind of a way to keep me organized and this is something that I use that will probably, I'll do for the school next year. I'll have each teacher and as we divide up our faculty for evaluation, this was, this was something that was very helpful for me. Um, we also had Bethany Lemoy come, who is um, who is the state of Georgia, or evaluation specialist for the state of Georgia. She spoke to the administration, then she came in and spoke to the leadership team, and was she is a very personable, um, very articulate person and able to convey this information. So we thought it would be helpful to have somebody who was actually very knowledgeable come in, speak to our, our leadership team, and she actually put a lot of things to rest, uh, worries that a lot of the, um, that a lot of the, uh, that a lot of our staff had, or our, our leader, the leadership team had. Um, her time was, I think, probably the best thing that we did this year because she was able to come in and articulate very clearly what TEKS was, whereas we were kind of fuddling through it, trying to read these b massive manuals about what TEKS was and what, what the expectations were. Um, and 
as we go into full imp implementation next year, I'm going to kind of talk about what that's going to look like. Every school in the county will be going through this, and um, like it, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. We were having some conversations before, and I'm going to talk about some of the concerns that we had later. But uh, it is very very. Uh, we'll, we'll have two formal observations. Um, they're 30 minutes each. We will have uh, four basically four walkthroughs so there'll be four walkthroughs two formal observations and then at the end of that you will have a uh, kind of a you'll have a, form, a summative conference so you have four walkthroughs 10 to 15 minutes each with reports that are loaded onto a platform and I'm going to talk about the platform in just a second you have two 30-minute observations and then you have a, a summative after each one of these you have a conference and then at the end of the you have a formative uh, a formative conference in the middle of the year you have another formative conference at the end of the year along with a summative uh, conference at that uh, you you discuss the slows in the OCT student surveys and that's all kind of in the in the uh, summative kind of in the summative <laughs> there you go conference there you go. all right uh, concerns as we went through this process and I, I had come from Gwinnett where we had begin conversations on this, so I was kind of familiar with it, and I knew kind of <coughs> some of the problems we were going to have, and they were pretty much what we expected. It's extremely time-consuming. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of the administration felt that there was a, a disproportionate amount of time required and energy required for our experienced teachers teachers that we knew that were good teachers that were doing what they needed to do we still have to go through this very lengthy process and document and document and document and meet and meet and meet um, conversations with staff about performance levels uh, the language is a little bit different than what we've used um, there's proficient versus needs improvement exemplary is something that is something that our teachers want to be exemplary, but the way that it's worded in the document and the t in instrument is that really proficient is where they're going to, mo most of them are going to be on most of the, so exemplary is not going to be something that, and most of our teachers are used to getting, you know, very, you know, glowing recommendations, so it's going to be a little bit different just because of the language. Like um, being a four in Horizons. I'm sorry. Like getting a, a level four in Horizons, or yes, a grade yes. Most and, grade and I think what the state has decided to do is they've decided to go to a number system. I think they're I think they're in the process of scratching this wording, and they're going to go through from a one to a four. So it's not mm -hmm. there's not a word associated. It's it's more of a number scale, which is I guess could be a little bit more objective. Um, we had some serious platform issues. Um, this was probably the biggest. Uh, obstacle in that uh, we had diff the, all this information has to be uploaded to a platform which the teachers can see after we put it on so everything is pretty much transparent as to what we've written um, we were having some serious issues getting that information onto the platform so uh, you know and I think there was a, it's a combination of issues but it's mostly technological stuff that that we dealt with um, we found that iPads tended to work a little bit better as we were in the classroom. Um, my desktop at school didn't work at all. Um, hmm. My laptop worked sometimes, and then um, I had a Mac at home that would work sometimes. So it was it was difficult. That the Apple seemed to work a little bit better. Equipment cap uh, compatibility is uh, compatibility is something again that I was talking about. Changes or modifications to the process. Our teachers are worried that they're going to change this process. You know, once we go through this year or two, are they going to change it? Or are they going to scrap it? Those of us who have been around a while have seen that come and go. Uh, EOCT versus, versus non EOCT teachers. It's very easy to measure EOCTs um, as a measuring stick, whereas non EOC teachers will have slows, which are developed by the county, which every county will have different slows. So there's not going to be necessarily consistency statewide as far as as far as what uh, a student uh, was what a teacher teaches. So if a teacher teaches classes where they're all slows, uh, it's going to be difficult to kind of compare those teachers from county to county throughout the state. So that's an, that's a, um, 
that's an issue. We also have impact on teachers of ELL and special education students. How are they going to fit into this process? Um, of course, they, those teachers have particular uh, challenges that, that regular teachers may not have. Um, also, teachers who teach are higher achievers. You know, how are they going to be evaluated? They're, you know, they would seem from the outside to have an advantage. They're already teaching our motivated students. And then how is that going to work? So those were our concerns. Um, basically, over the last year, um, we, have, we have learned a lot. Uh, like I said, our primary concern uh, are the technological issues as well as, uh, as, well as the time that is going to be necessary for administration especially. Like I said, we'll probably have about 40 uh, staff members that we're going to have to actually evaluate at South. Um, then you're looking at considerable amounts of time when you have, when you have to have several conferences throughout the year as well as extensive uh, evaluate, evaluations and um, observations. So those are, that's kind of, um, I know that's a lot of information in a short period of time. I'm trying to get through all of it within my allotted 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know how I did, but <laughs> I'm trying to get about through, through three binders that are about that thick in about 10 minutes so I was sitting here figuring time wise because that's one thing that we were talking about yes. before and if and this is very rough but it's almost the equivalent of um, I, I was guessing that maybe you would spend six hours at a minimum per teacher uh, if you had 183 teachers and I'm I think that's a very minimum amount by the time you did your two 30 minute, then the, the yes. 40 minutes of 10 minutes, plus the time that it took you administratively wise, plus the time you have to talk to them. I think six is very conservative amount of time. That's 1,080, almost 1,100 hours yes, a year for your staff. And then you divide that by the weeks, you're talking 30 hours a week of just evaluation time. And then you divide that by each one of you I mean, that's that's a day of a, every week. Is there four Speaking to my uh, it's 180 teaching days, 180 school days, and if you're doing 180 teachers, right. yes. that's one a day, but you can't possibly do one in uh -huh. a whole day. No, and yeah. and we were talking about the structure of our schools are going to change a little bit due to the nature of what we're going to have to do. Um, we're probably not going to be as access as accessible uh, to parents and students really because we're it's. it's we do a lot of things that, that, you know, in high school we deal with, you never know what's yeah. going, literally you never know what's going to happen. So um, it is very time consuming. And I did speak, uh, I, I was on the phone today to uh, some of my cohorts in, uh, in Gwinnett and the way that they've done it, and a lot of schools did, weren't able to do it. Um, the, the school that I was at, they actually had someone who, won, someone who was in charge of it, which I will be next year, but they literally sat down every week and went through, this is what you're going to do. And they had to, they had a spreadsheet and they actually had to methodically go through. And that's sure. the way that they, Keep that's the way there. that they did it. Cause I was sitting there looking, I was doing the math as well. I was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. No. But. And, and when you look at that survey that we just sent out and everybody wants to keep that small town feel that openness that we have in our school system, this is changing the whole culture for Scythe County Schools. And that's something that we need to look at as a board, staff-wise and everything. It's and just I, scary. I, I think that, you know, it is, it's a massive initiative and it's, mm -hmm. it's something that it's, it's going to change the way, that, the way that we operate, I have no mm -hmm. doubt. Now these platform issues, is that an issue at the state level or is it with our equipment or a combination of both? What? How the only thing that I know, for, the only thing that I know for sure, the state says we shouldn't be having any issues. Okay. Um, I know <laughs> Gwinnett County had issues their first year that they piloted it, and okay. and through their work with the state, they were able to get a lot of their issues taken care of. And I don't think last year they had that many issues. Okay. Um, I think as we roll into next year full implementation with all the schools, we're going to see some see issues, and that's yeah, something that we'll have to works. work with the state about. I'm, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, again, that's something that, um, you know, we probably need to look at our technology in the schools and mm -hmm. does it talk, I mean, how well does it communicate with the state uh, with what they have in place on the, uh, uh, as the platform? It's not real easy to use either, I'll, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. so that's, again, going to just increase the time that you're going to have to use, yes. spend. 
Well, I have one question for you. I know in listening to other presentation and talking to teachers that, or schools that have gone through pilot programs, yes, that teachers can be apprehensive about this coming, but the teachers who have gone through pilot programs end up embracing it and are excited about it because they yes. actually are happy to get the feedback. Yes. How are you? Ha how is this going over at South? I, how are I you think the teachers are well, that? and because what's what the word has been from from people who have come out of the who have come into the system from from Fulton and Cobb and Gwinnett is it, it's the good teachers have really nothing to worry about. It's nothing to really. They're not going to have to go out of their way to do anything other than what they're doing now. It's the administration that really is going to require that that's that have, have really are going to carry the burden of this. I, good teachers are going to be fine. There's not going to be any issues with, with as far as what the teachers do in the classroom. And at South, we've got very, I'm not worried about the teachers. The teachers. Okay. But they're okay with it. As yeah, yeah. The t uh, you know, I think the teachers are, are okay about it. Okay. I, I think there was a, a little, when we began to talk about it, just the sheer amount, if you look at it, <coughs> but once the word gets out that they they just do what they need to do and the rest of it takes care of itself, yeah. Anything else? How much <coughs> How much time do we spend now? Like, how much more time? Is it twice as much, or? Uh, how much more time will it? Will it be than what you spend doing evaluations now? Uh, <sighs> a lot more? I'd say <laughs> double to three double, times. Double, that's what I was wondering. Double to three times. Or more than three, yeah. wow. That's not good. <laughs> But you know, we've been we're we're lucky that we have good teachers and we have good students. And 99.9% .9 of the time, things are going all right. We can walk by and look in and say this, you know, everything's good here, and we can, you know, and we our our department chairs are good, and they, you know, they they help us out a lot because they're the content experts, and they, you know, they know their teachers well. If there's an issue, they can come tell me. I do social studies, so I have a relatively large department. They can come and say, we have an issue with this teacher. This is the problem. I can go take care of it. This is a little bit different than, than doing those, that type of thing. Hmm. So. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. But it's his job and not mine. Hmm. Mr. Mercer. Good afternoon. I know it's um, quite a surprise that I'm doing something with math and data. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Cohen and Mr. Perkle for their leadership and guidance. I, I really enjoyed our conversations going through this project. Um, one, of the, one of the driving factors, uh, and if you'll remember when I uh, presented some data uh, back in uh, summer of last year, we talked about coordinate algebra, and it was a hot topic. And even though um, we as a district um, did much better than the state comparably when you look at our when you look at our scores of does not meets and meets we still didn't perform at where we wanted to achievement wise uh, so you can see that uh, compared to the state of georgia uh, our meets 52 versus the state of georgia 32 and our exceeds more than double 13 versus five so Looking at this, uh, we wanted to be able to uh, come up with a way for our uh, schools to improve. So um, one of the uh, driving factors of my decision making for results team uh, was to take on coordinate algebra to see what we could do uh, to improve achievement in, in our district. So the project plan, uh, district-wide collaboration, that was really the key. The key here was collaborating district-wide, looking at um, teachers that performed well and schools that performed well and tapping those teachers and being able to replicate that across the system. What are they doing that works? And let's replicate that and let's continue that in other areas. Um, so we created a data team focused on improving student achievement in coordinate algebra. So throughout the year, the team analyzed data, discussed appropriate instructional strategies and monitored the progress, which I'll outline here in a few minutes. The project was monitored by uh, comparing pre and post interim data during the year. Uh, so we did t uh, come into play with that with our interim, which is our uh, countywide assessment that we do. Uh, the project will, um, will be evaluated by comparing its achievement on the 2013 and 14 administrations of the coordinate algebra EOCT. We don't give that uh, EOCT until Monday and Tuesday of next week. So uh, once, uh, once we get that data, uh, I'll be e eagerly waiting to, to grab that data and to compare it to see how we did with last year. 
Uh, these are the members of, of the DMR team, which DMR is decision making for results, uh, and it's a it's a district wide data team that focuses on uh, district wide achievement. Uh, you can see that I had a number of teachers, and so I tried to get one uh, coordinate algebra teacher from each of our schools, um, and then I also had some district uh, some some leadership level from from each of the uh, uh, different levels, high school. Uh, I also tried to um, have some people involved that also had elementary and middle school uh, experience as well. And then I also uh, uh, used uh, some of our district level leadership uh, in content specialist uh, Erin Zitka that helped a lot. And she helped a lot with connecting the data to the instructional strategies. Uh, the standards in personal growth inspire standards that uh, were addressed, common core, the performance standards, standard-based instruction, of, of course, assessment and data analysis. And then and personally, just looking and interpreting data, it's an area that I try to continually grow every day. Uh, aligning effective teaching strategies, that's one of the areas that I feel like in our district we really need to improve because that's where it's going to uh, help us with our achievement if we tie those specific instructional strategies to specific deficiencies. Uh, instructional knowledge and then also just building relationships with um, just uh, with the district and the uh, teachers and schools uh, the, uh, the the plan was aligned to our system direction for, with our continuous improvement uh, with with our strategic plan and also with our annual school improvement uh, you can see that uh, the DMR process is ingrained in all of those pieces so first meeting uh, we met during a um, district-wide uh, day uh, and we met for a couple hours and we went through the the steps of the data team uh, process and the step one is to collect and chart data step two analyze and prioritize needs three establish a smart goal so that we know what our end result needs to be and then also to look at instructional strategies I'll outline these these steps so step one conduct that treasure hunt we want to look at what what are our areas of strength and what are our areas of weakness considerations we want to look at measures of data triangulation we want to disaggregate the data and then we want to reflect on what worked so we looked at uh, district coordinate algebra EOCT results uh, we also looked at the released EOCT items and commentary that the state provided uh, we also looked at the coordinate algebra study guide we looked at the state coordinate algebra analysis they provided an in-depth analysis on how the students did and then also tied that back to the released items in the coordinate algebra study guide uh, that was statewide but a lot of times you're going to see trends statewide those are the same trends that you're going to see in your county uh, we also looked at the classroom data from last year and that was bringing in those teachers and looking at they have them personally re personally reflect on their teaching and achievement and the achievement of their school next step we analyze the data to prioritize what our needs are so we looked at strengths what are needs or weaknesses important uh, piece is looking at your strengths because a lot of times your strengths are going to tell you how what you have to do to improve your weaknesses so when we looked at uh, we looked at the data we looked at uh, the coordinate algebra and I presented data for them I broke it down into the three strands the three major strands algebra geometry and statistics and probability uh, and you'll see that um, for the most part, uh, we saw um, across the, the district that we needed uh, that one of our lowest performing areas on the coordinate algebra was the algebra piece of it. Uh, but you also see that there were some middle schools um, that one of their lowest areas was statistics and probability. Um, so important piece of bringing all of those people in is so that our middle schools can work together and our high schools can work together and then they can also collaborate across uh, levels. So, I was going to ask, so our middle schools, our eighth graders actually scored pretty well. They did very well. Uh, in fact, uh, we had less than, what, uh, I think, almost 99% met. I'd have to go back and look at that for sure, but 99% yeah. met. That's amazing. Met and exceeded. Hmm. So, um, so in, in, in other words, that's another important piece of bringing everybody in to analyze what they're doing at that level so we can incorporate that into to all the other levels. Uh, what the two prioritized needs that we developed were uh, understanding and, and interpreting word problems and then also working on exponential functions and this was something that tied back to what the state analysis stated and we did see uh, uh, a deficiency or an area of need as well we wanted to also establish our smart goals which is step three 
specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. So after looking at all the data and gathering that data, we came up with two uh, goals. We wanted to have a goal for not only for meeting, but also moving from meeting to exceeding. Uh, and so you can see that for meeting, we wanted to move from 65% to 71% meeting exceeding, and then also for our exceeding move from 13 to 19%. We wanted to quantify our expectations in the end. Uh, step four was to uh, select specific strategies. So during that meeting, we also, uh, when they were grouped and they looked at what our specific deficiencies were, they looked at the, in those areas and they selected specific instructional strategies that they were using uh, that were research-based that would help us uh, improve our achievement in those areas of need. Uh, the uh, selected instructional strategies that the group de uh, uh, decided on were to emphasize and encourage academic vocabulary, modeling, uh, real-world application, and then incorporate alternate representations when working with exponential functions. Since that was a key piece that we uh, needed to improve on, they wanted to uh, also in, in include that key piece. Those other pieces really are interwoven with, with everything that we do in mathematics. Uh, skipped over step five because that's results indicators. We did not focus on that, uh, that piece as much, but we did want to focus on the monitor and evaluate results. So throughout the year, uh, we had four other meetings, October 30th, December 4th, March 13th, and August 2014 is the meeting that we're going to have in the future to kind of look at how these um, results came together and to compare them. Uh, meeting number two, October 30th, uh, we reviewed the pre-interim results focused on mastery of standards. Uh, we want to look at what our current, they get that baseline, so we could look at our improvement over time. Uh, we also reviewed the implementation of the instructional strategies that we had discussed at our initial meeting. Uh, this is an outline of what, what our pre-interim results look like. Highlighted uh, at the bottom are three areas that we wanted to work on, and you can see with the pre-interim results that they are uh, near, uh, near the bottom, one of the uh, lowest achieving areas, uh, with emphasis on the, um, the standard that's highlighted on the left-hand side as well. That was specifically exponential functions and improving in that area. Meeting three, um, we really got together and just shared what our best practices were. We looked at, we looked at how the instructional strategies were going, what did we see, did we need to make any improvements. Um, you have to continually improve what you're doing, uh, and so we looked at uh, ways that we could do that, and really it was a great discussion between all the teachers about um, how everything is being implemented in their uh, school. We also reviewed some of the real-world application, and I tell you, I was really impressed with, uh, uh, there was a couple middle schools that had some really great uh, application-based problems. Meeting four in March, uh, we reviewed district-wide post-interim results to kind of get a snapshot of where we were. Uh, we looked at the growth of all standards. Growth was seen in, uh, in one of the areas, uh, priority needs that you'll see. Uh, some of the inferences, standards with lowest growth were addressed at the beginning of the year. Uh, so they felt that uh, at the beginning of the year as time went on, the growth wasn't there because they weren't coming back to that as much as they should, and a lot of that remediation happens later in the year focusing and also focus on algebra standards during the remainder of the year. So just uh, side by side, uh, you'll see that the, the, the two areas um, that we have are still near the bottom. Those were some that were um, they focused on at the beginning of the year, and they're going to be coming back to those. But I did want to uh, notice that we did see considerable growth with, um, with our specific standard dealing with exponential functions and equations. And this is a growth over, uh, overall. Uh, that same standard is highlighted. Uh, it's, uh, we, had sh we showed 28% growth uh, from the time of the pre-interim and the, the post-interim. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we are pretty happy with, with those results so far and um, are really interested in seeing the end result with the EOCTs. So we have one more meeting that's going to be uh, scheduled in, in August where we're going to revisit our SMART goal. And then we're also going to take the scores uh, from the EOCT that's coming up next week and look at achievement, look at growth, uh, and look at the, sp the specific areas that, uh, that, we, that we worked in. Uh, my vision is, my vision would be that this is not something we just do when we need to, when we see that we have a low performing area, but maybe this can, um, um, 
be uh, uh, the few, how um, our professional development and how our, our work and collaboration as a district looks like in the future when we come together and we specifically go through the steps of the data team and the DMR process and we look at those deficient areas and we look at those areas of strength and we, we build from there. Um, again, you know, one of the most important pieces of this was district-wide collaboration. Uh, I wanted to have an opportunity to get, ever, uh, get these, the key people from, from the bill, buildings in the same room and talk about what instruction looks like and what do we need to do to improve that instruction in order to move, uh, move forward as a district. That's going to be so key um, because at the other legislative meeting that we went to, that or something, I was in Mike's dome report, that there's so much criticism of the integrated algebra and we're, we're dealing with it and going forward and I'm so afraid if we spend all this time in doing the right thing and then they throw it out is saying well because others can't achieve that doesn't solve anything instead of tackling the problem and making it work they're just going to back off of it and uh, I'm, I'm just impressed with what y'all are doing I'm, and looking forward to seeing the scores. I bet that'd be great. I'm sure. Yeah. Is there a process in place then when these teachers go back to their own base school then to incorporate all this? I mean, is that a formal process? Yeah, the idea was that uh, the, the, the teachers involved were mm -hmm. the, uh, the data team leaders at their school for coordinate algebra. Now, okay. in every case, that wasn't the case, but mm -hmm. in every case, those teachers were on the coordinate algebra data team. Um, especially at middle schools where you really only have really one coordinate algebra, one teacher that teaches that coordinate okay, algebra. Really but the idea was they were going to take the discussions and what we looked at and what we came up with in the instructional strategies and take that back to their building to implement and to share results, to share areas of need and, and really the whole process. So that formal piece was looking at that data team process back at the school and incorporating district-wide information mm -hmm. along with school-wide because even though we came up with district-wide goals that, that we that we just went over I encourage them to look at their own data and come up with their own smart goal <coughs> for them because this goal is good for the for, good for the district as a whole but each school also needs to show that uh, that improvement and have that accountability piece mm -hmm. so Great. you said your next meeting is August the tests are Monday Tuesday did I miss one? Do you think the results will be in? Well, the results will we'll probably get unofficial results um, early June, um, well, probably late May, early June. Uh, but be, to be able to get that together and to get the teachers in, you know, end of the year is hectic. But uh, I, I figured that get, given the summer and be able to look at that data and bring them in, and then we can share that with everybody. You know, Kristen, your comment about the middle school grades doing so well, those kids are going to be in high school. so. There's, there's bound to be an increase in the test scores with that. Well, I would also imagine the eighth graders that are taking it are advanced across right. the board, so there's yeah. mm -hmm. a different well, that's true. group of yeah. kids. Yeah, very but, yes, yes ma'am, very top percent. Mm -hmm. Very top percent of the class. was still mm -hmm. interesting. I was curious how they did comparatively mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. yeah, they Excellent. did very well. And, and to keep in mind that um, you know, most of their, uh, half of what they uh, study, their standards, and, and is part of the analytic geometry so um, there's a number of those standards that they deal with at the beginning of the year so they really have to focus on coming back and, and looking and cycling through those standards before the OCT for remediation okay. impressive great thank you, thank you. Good. all right well, thank lots you lots of interesting information mm -hmm. thank you well thank you it was my pleasure have a great evening Okay, next we have uh, Mr. Perkle with the out-of-district transfer updates that we asked for. Okay, you had asked for just a, a summary of the out-of-district uh, totals. Um, basically just uh, this may be a little bit confusing so I'll if it is I apologize but I'll explain kind of what you see here this is the 2014-15 approved out of district um, these are the totals for the 14-15 school year as you know several years ago we stopped having parents reapply every single year and um, once they apply they're there at that school until they finish that school unless there becomes a problem or an issue that the principal revokes the out-of-district request. 
So those just roll up. But every year we get new requests for um, various reasons. So if you'll see on this sheet where it says 14, 15 out of district, uh, those numbers are the total for those for the schools of the new out of district re requests that we received this year. And you can see in general the reasons uh, there wouldn't be there would be a huge document if we went through every form and listed every reason because in elementary and middle there become a lot of different reasons. Um, so you, for example, Big Creek um, this year they got uh, received 34 <coughs> out of district request. 26 of those were redistricted students. Uh, and seven employees, children, and one other. Now you can see then the very last column, the 69. The 69 is the total number of students at that school with an out of district request. So that includes the 34. So if you wanted to find out how many students were at Brookwood before this year's out of district request, then you'd obviously take 69 and subtract 34. And that, so um, in Big Creek. Big Creek. Yeah. I'm sorry, Big <laughs> Creek. I don't even know what I said, but I'm at Big yeah. Creek. Thank you. Um, if you go all the way down to the bottom, then uh, of course there's, I don't think, unless you want me to, there's no need to go through each of these school by school. But if, for example, if you go on down to the bottom for South Central High School, um, they, they have a total of 216 students at, at Central, for South Central High School, that have an out of district request. This year, they got 58 requests. Um, that made up, helped to make up that total of 216. So in some cases for those schools that are just went through redistricting, some of the numbers that are in this year's grand total will roll off next year in part because they were say rising fifth graders, rising eighth graders and or siblings thereof and they only get one year and then you're done. It's true. Right. So just as some of those high school numbers will, will change because some of those out of district requests are seniors right. this year, and they'll be gone next year. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I get is, you know, those that are restricted, that I'm sorry, that are asked for out of district requests because they because of program need, and we do have some unique programs at different schools, even though we are full. But like for example, Central has STEM, and people want to go to Central to go to STEM. If they go, if they do an out of district and it's approved at the high school level, is there something on the form, particularly at this high school that's already full, or any high school for that matter, that says, okay, you're coming here for Program X. If you don't get into Program X, or if you start as a freshman and their program doesn't start until you're a junior, and you, you choose not to really go for it or don't <coughs> make it, are you, you know, do you understand up front you're, you're going back, or? There's nothing on the, on I think your question was, is there anything on the form? Yeah. There's nothing on the form that tells them if you say you're going for the STEM program and you are enrolled in the ninth grade and then in the tenth grade that you say that you're all of a sudden you're not wanting to, that you'll go back. There's nothing on the form that says that. Okay. We do have conversations every year with high school, especially high school um, principals that um, they are to keep up with the students that are in IB program or the STEM program. And, and I'll give you an example that of, of, for example, for Sci Central, since you mentioned that with the STEM program. They have every year since STEM, and this, this happened this year, they may have had, um, and I'm making the number up, they may have had 100 students to do an out of district for the STEM program. And then, uh, because, because they have to have the form turned in before they actually um, go through all the information to see if they qualify for the program. Mm -hmm. So what happens is Kim Head then emails me, and she's already emailed me on all the ones that this has happened to, and, and we email the parents to say, this student, had, we approved the out-of-district, but they didn't make it into the program. Okay. So they're going back to their base school. Their base school. And we notify, they notify the parent, we notify the registration center, and they change it back in Infinite Campus. Um, so that's an example. We, okay. So we have that conversation every year. There's nothing on the form okay. that says to the parent, but we have notified parents to say, you're, you're not in it, right. so you're so out. Of, you don't need an out of so district. Even, for the so even so, it might not be on the form, but even if it's years later and they don't get in, they're not in their program for whatever reasons. They're back. They go back to their home base. We tell the principals to monitor that okay. and to let us know. Right. Can I? Can, could I stand here and say to okay. you 
that yeah. every student that that, that, right. that doesn't go, go into that or decide in their junior year that they're not going to be in that program, that that principal has sent them back, I can't honestly tell you that that's happened in every situation. Okay. We encourage them encourage to look at that, that, keep up with it, keep track of it, and and I know from the STEM program that they do that because they do, of what I just explained to you. Okay. Well, thank you for doing these numbers. I appreciate asking, and I, I know you answered a lot of my questions over no the last problem. few weeks, and I particularly found the data on those schools that get redistricted. Okay, can you know, I'll switch to that? Then. Yeah, that one's interesting because, you know, we go through the process, and, and Mr. Emerson does a lot of work anticipating how many kids could move from school A to B, and it's really interesting to, I mean, you never know because I heard mm -hmm. different people say, well, our whole subdivision, all of our eighth graders are going to go or not together, and they're mm -hmm. all trying to figure it out. Right. So it's interesting to see after the fact how many really decide to make that cut and not. Well, so. and, and it's also interesting that um, you would probably be surprised that because this happens frequently, especially with, with the rising fifth graders or the rising eighth graders, and I actually have had two more just this week, and that is um, the parents will send an email to have said, um, one was at Big Creek who said, we. Um, we did an out of district and it was approved for us to stay as a rising fifth grader, but um, we now have decided that we want our child, our fifth grader, to go on to Brookwood. Mm -hmm. And so they revoked it. So I've already had three, four, I had two this week, um, probably maybe two last week, of those rising fifth graders that now they change, you know, they think that's what they want to do, mm -hmm. and then as time moves on, then they really want them just to go ahead and go on to the school. Well, I think some of that credit goes. I think it was a little bit of a top-down encouragement. I know the principals at those levels did, early right. on, months ago, right. did introduction nights to parents and students that were moving from one school to the next, like from Big Creek to Brookwood mm -hmm. and into mm -hmm. Big Creek. And I, I was there some of those nights. Mm -hmm. And you saw the parents that were coming that were being moved come in a little apprehensive mm -hmm. with their kid. And once they got in the buildings and saw it was another good school and there was teachers and the all right. exciting things, that their moods completely changed. Mm -hmm. So I think once I think that idea of having those early on mm -hmm. introduction meetings really really helped. Yeah, they do a good job with that. But and again, I won't go through all of these because you can, I think you understand it. But just yeah. to go through the first one, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what this is, these are just the uh, the schools uh, involved in redistricting with this last redistricting effort. For example, Big Creek had 33 rising fifth graders. Those were 33 students that we redistricted from Big Creek who were rising fifth graders. Out of that th 33, 22 of those decided to stay there as a rising fifth grader under the out-of-district uh, request or through an out-of-district request. Out of those 22, four siblings um, will stay for that one year only so that they're still all together, but then after next year, then they'll go they'll go. So that's kind of what, the, that doesn't mean that there are 22 stayed and then plus that, uh, four more different, but the, out of the 22, four of them were siblings. That's a relatively low number considering I think there was in the neighborhood of 250 yes. students that were to go from Big Creek right. to Brookwood, so that's all in all. And it's typically that way, you, you, you would think that um, especially when parents are um, at forums and speaking about redistricting, one would think that um, they for sure would not go. But once it's, as always, <laughs> once it's done and it's over and it's finished, typically they go and they're, they're fine with it for the most part. But the other side of that coin, I notice this about a total of 8% of our students are out of district. And so therefore we do allow the flexibility as we always talk about, our intent is to allow flexibility where it can be had. And so, you know, around 8% of the students have that flexibility and are using it. We have a lot. We approve a lot of them, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Right. Perkle. You're welcome. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we have Dan Jones with the preliminary budget discussion. Well, we don't have for you tonight the big book to go through. Uh, we'll have that for you next week. We've been working night and day on this for quite a while and have had some 
problems with some of the software that we've been working trying to get some solutions. So I've got you an overall big picture look at the budget tonight, and then we will have the detail book for you next week. And we'll be glad to go through that in detail if you want us to. Uh, if you look at your first page, this is a summary of everything, and we'll drill down a little bit as we go through these other pages. Our local revenues are $136.5 million. And you can see that this is up $7.5 million. Now, this is based on the information that we currently have. It's not final digest or anything. It's just preliminary stuff, but that's up almost 6%. Our state and federal revenues, $164.8 million, and they're up 12%. And again, we do not have the official QBE allotment sheet. They sent us out a preliminary estimate based on the budget. The governor has signed the budget, but they haven't published the allotment sheet yet. But that should be fairly close. Uh, salaries and benefits, now these include the extra three days back for all employees plus a step increase. And you can see, now this also includes, uh, and I'll show you that in just a minute, the, the new positions for next year. And that's up 18 million or almost 7%. Mm -hmm. And operations overall are up uh, three and a half million, a little over 10%. How many new positions is that total? We know, roughly, or... Yeah. If you look on about the fourth, fifth page back, okay. there's a breakdown of all this. 111 school-based positions and 10 uh, social worker drivers, mechanics, that type of stuff. Okay. And the cost is calculated there. You can see that. Okay, that's the summary. We'll get into the next page is the revenue. And again, this is based on our current millage rate of 16.3 mills. Uh, that uh, below the summaries, you can see that our projected digest will generate uh, 7.5 million new dollars. And that is about a 6% increase in the digest. And our QBE formula earnings, the amount that we've got here, include the midterm adjustment. We're bumping that up this year because of the growth. Uh, the QBE, the austerity adjustment actually went down. Uh, so we're gaining almost $6 million from the decrease in austerity. Our growth amount is $5.6 million. And now this is based on the allotment information that they have sent us so far. And we are including $6 million for midterm, so that's $17.5 million new state dollars. And our state revenue has gone up about 12%. So our overall revenue is $301,343,000 based on the information we have now. <laughs> And then the next page just shows you a comparison of the digest for the last several years with the preliminary information that I do have. And one thing to point out, if you look at the net m and digest, we are still not where we were back in 2008 or before. Yeah. Nearly 20% less in those years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it has increased, which is a good thing. It's up about 6%. We're still not back where we were five or six, seven years ago. Okay. And the next page is just an overall summary of the salaries and benefits. You can see by functional area, the increase or decrease. And you, again, we're up about 18.8 .8 million in salaries and benefits. Now included in that is there was an increase in uh, teacher retirement amount. However, health insurance, they held the rates for this next year. I was going to ask you that. That's yeah. good. That's a good thing for this yeah. year, but 
Because it was the, supposed to go up. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. But, but for the not. next year, you can bet that it will probably go back up. Mm -hmm. So we'll take it this year. And again, this the next sheet is the differences in positions. And there's a comparison there and the cost <coughs> that goes along with that. So the uh, increase there for new positions is running about $8 million. And you can see the different breakdown between teachers, principals, I mean, assistant principals, counselors, uh, social workers, eight new, seven new drivers, and two bus mechanics. What is the $900,000 increase in the um, transportation? Oh, I'm on this page still. Is, am I not seeing that right? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, there is. Uh, Nine hundred twenty. <coughs> excuse me. Nine hundred twenty-six thousand dollar increase. Uh, we'll have to get you the detail on that. Okay. And th this is what we'll have next week is all the detail that backs these up. Mm -hmm. But looking at this, uh, two hundred thousand is personnel cost. Well, this is just yeah. This is salaries and benefits. Salaries and benefits well, for the nine hundred twenty-six thousand. Well, and I would imagine if the bond passes and we get. The new buses with increased enrollment, some of that could just be right. That's going to be the, the reason for the like increase in mechanics okay. and the drivers. More buses, yeah. It said on this, it's seven new bus drivers. Well, but those buses are to replace old buses. I mean, there'll and be some I think, both. I think they said that we have aging and just the increased enrollment required more. I think it's pretty sure yeah. it's it says nine seven new bus drivers on here. That's both. Well, they about 70 bus drivers won't make $900,000. I mean, I'm yeah. just saying that's yeah. a lot if we're going to get those new buses. Yeah. I just wonder what it's just 200000 of the 950 Yeah, 950. I, I was talking question. about the total. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we're giving uh, days back to bus drivers right. and yeah. also a step increase so that will equate. See, for all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're just not accustomed to that. It's been so long. Mm -hmm. I know we may have to refresh people's memory on what that means. The <laughs> step increase. It's been so long. So, 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 Mr. Jones, every year we do this where we're waiting to get each month or each week we're waiting to get the final digest numbers and the final. And we think, is this it? Is this it? And can you refresh my memory roughly when we really, really, really think that this is it? And even though it changes one more week. <laughs> well, I hope. When we do final budget adoption in June, that we'll have the final digest by then. Okay. Sometimes it's the day of our board meeting. There have been times when they bring it to me right before the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, usually we have the last several years we have had it uh, before we do final adoption. Okay. So we'll. So the plan is we'll get the book next week with everything, and yes, we will we will vote on a preliminary budget. Right. And then. If there's anything that questions or changes, but we won't vote on, t on the final budget until our regular meeting in that's, June. That's scheduled yeah. right now. That's good. If if we don't have the digest and we want to wait for that, there may be last part of June. We might have to have a call meeting that's briefly to finalize budget. Okay. Well, let's hope we don't. Yeah. It just seems like it's coming up fast. Sure yes, it does. <laughs> it's, been <laughs> so sure. it's been so busy. It's been so much fun. Uh, the Last page I've got for you tonight. These are operational costs. This is everything other than salaries and benefits. And you can see that we're at a total of uh, three and a half million. And if you look down, there's some little detail here. We're uh, going to replace some classroom computers. So we're entering into a new lease. It's about two million dollars. Uh, we're adding modular classrooms because of the growth. So we have to have furniture and replacement for, for some of the uh, furniture because of the growth. There's an increase in textbooks. So out of the three and a half million, two point eight million is made up in instructional cost. Uh, Fifty thousand is for the SLO printing that's going to be required, and then we are adding a number of new modular classrooms, and the rent on those is. Four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. So, out of the three and a half million in change, in increases, there's three point three million of it right there. 
So that's the majority of, of the increase in the operational cost. The modular classrooms, Bill, are, are they all going to be for new ones that we need, or are some of them going to replace some of the old ones that we have? Just for new ones that we need, 53. 53. So we're adding 53, but we're not replacing any of the ones that we have. Wow. Okay. And the only question I have is around the Affordable Care Act. We had a presentation last year about our part-time folks and having to run queries against those to see how much they're working to decide if we have to offer them benefits. I don't know if this is for you or for Candy, if we've got that result back yet, where are we at? Is that going to be an impact to us, do we think? Yeah. Speak to that, Candy. Yes, we have less than two people. Would have qualified with okay. safe harbor initially at five percent of all employees, mm -hmm. and now it's gone up to thirty cent percent. So we did not uh, plan to change our business rules on utilization, particularly of substitutes at okay. this time. And right now, we think it will have no fiscal impact. The part we don't know is about the affordability piece of the nine point five percent of family income, but nobody can plan for that. Okay. So I think we're okay from a budget perspective. That sounds good. Okay. That's what I have for you tonight on budget. Uh, like I said, we'll give you the detail next week. We'll get you the book. This got a lot more than uh, we yeah, have here. Yes. But this, we wanted to give you a quick overall summary of uh, the big picture as to where we stand. And any questions? A little more encouraging than other years. Yes. Yes, much more. Good job. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Alrighty, thank you. <coughs> okay, next we have our future agenda items. Does anybody have anything they just <laughs> we have a lot to do, but if you have <laughs> something else. <laughs> no, just that one I had added last month, which I think we don't have a work session until August at this point, right? After right. refreshment. I was on a yeah, you want to talk about rezoning uh, school I don't know what I called it at the time, but uh, school attendance zones. We did have it on yeah. Okay. June. Uh, yeah. June. Do we have one in June? It works yes. in June? Mm -hmm. We have a regular meeting. Put regular meeting. Regular meeting. Mm -hmm. We don't have a regular session. We don't have a regular session again. People are going to GSBA, so we usually don't. Why don't we time we put it there and see if I've got some more work to do to get ready for that. So if I don't think I can make it by June, I'll let you know and I'll try. But if I, I've got some more background work to do. Well, it's a big agenda, so we yeah, can so always, we can always might move have it. to delay it if I'm not ready. There's usually the probability that we would have a called meeting to to address personnel also during that time mm -hmm. and our budget debate based on the timing that mm -hmm. we get the digest and or the timing that we have the flow of if you look, look at tonight we have a number of new hires coming in and that will be the case over the next mm -hmm. couple of months so there will be some opportunities for us to be together. My well, it's just we have so much to do between all of the work we have between now and the end of year and graduations there's just a lot going yeah. on right now so with the um budget here we don't have any hearings if we don't raise the millage rate if there is this a rollback take that's the, correct. the rollback is going to keep us from yeah, having we have we the other don't have enough information this time to, to know. calculate the rollback rate. okay okay but with the budget technically we have since we put that we we had a, we vote on a draft that we have to do it put it out there for a couple of weeks or whatever yeah, the time I period is so that's our that's our public hearing before we actually do the final vote okay anything else no. okay next we have um, the adoption of the 2014-15 employee work calendars with dr norton i'll make this fairly simple uh, but thank you so much for entertaining uh, the addition of three additional days for all of our personnel next year. We also, of course, have added three days to the student calendar. Basically, what we are presenting to you to adopt calendars for next year for those three additional days, as we hope to hand out contracts to our teachers tomorrow with those days represented. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is recommended that the Forsyth County Board of Education approve the 2014-15 employee work calendars as presented for the various classes of employees in your information. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Mm -mm, that's a good one. All in favor? Thank you, you very much on behalf of all of our personnel. 
Okay, next we have executive session for personnel. Do I have a motion to so go into executive second. session? A motion by Ann, a second by Nancy. All in favor? Unanimous. 